Thank you, Nicole. And I really appreciate um, the MDA chapter in Philadelphia for inviting me to speak today. Um, and the topic of my talk today will be the best practices for care for neuromuscular patients. And I left out a, a subtitle, which is multidisciplinary clinic and why it is important for your care. Um, I have no disclosures. So I think that uh, it is very fitting that my talk follows that of Dr. Patterson and Brianna, who really went into depth uh, to explain the current uh, concepts behind uh, muscular dystrophies, motor neuron disease, and, um, and the genetics of it. And I particularly appreciated Brianna's talk because I think she presented a lot of the, um, our current understanding of the complexity of a lot of these um, genetic disorders that we see clinically. So, as Brianna mentioned, that muscular dystrophies, motor neuron disease, are a group of genetically complex disorders. And I really like this slide uh, that I pulled up from a paper that was published by Kay Davies in 1993. So it wasn't that long ago when all we knew about dystrophin um, was that it was connected to several other proteins on the membranes of our muscle uh, cells. And that's how you controlled muscle contraction. And really, the mutations that caused um, dystrophy, uh, um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy was not identified until the 80s. Um, and this is one of our early, one of the earliest diagrams that was published in 1993 that showed the, our understanding of the various proteins that were involved in muscular dystrophy. Now, I want to fast forward to the publication, again, by uh, Dr. K. Davies' group out of the UK, where she and her colleagues depicted all the newer proteins that were discovered from the 1980s up to the late um, 90s and early 2000s. And you can see our improved understanding of all the different proteins that are involved in muscular dystrophies. And they have since been named and um, properly identified. And this was really the beginning of our, uh, the greater understanding of the underlying biology of what causes muscular dystrophy. Now I'm gonna fast forward another 15 years to 2017. And this is an updated diagram of our understanding of muscular dystrophies and all the genetic uh, genes that causes uh, this heterogeneous group of disorders. And now not only do we know that there are membrane proteins that are involved in causing muscular dystrophies, I'm sorry about that, but there are also proteins that are involved in the contractile apparatus or the proteins that help the muscle contract, as well as the mitochondria, and the proteins on the nuclear membrane, which uh, when abnormal can all cause different forms of muscular dystrophy. Now, coupled with our understanding of the underlying uh, uh, protein abnormalities in the muscle that can cause various forms of muscular dystrophy, the evolution genetics has also identified all the different genetic mutations that lead to the abnormal protein being produced in causing these disorders. And as you can see, on the very top is uh, the uh, uh, Duchenne and Becker's muscular dystrophy, which is a, one of the earliest genes that was identified to be abnormal that causes muscular dystrophy. And subsequent to that, you can see the enormous list of um, genetic mutations that are now known to cause muscular dystrophies. I have not included here the exhaustive list of genes that can cause um, motor neuron diseases, uh, charcot marie tooth disorders, and ALS, because I think that my screen probably will have difficulty filling all the different mutations that, that has now been identified. But you can, I just want to show you the, the complexity, uh, the genetic complexity of these hereditary neuromuscular disorders. Not only have we learned that um, these hereditary neuromuscular diseases are complex genetically, affected our, our shoulder girdle and our hip girdles and sometimes our truncal muscles. But we have come to understand that the pattern of weakness in muscular dystrophy patients can vary significantly. And this illustrates all the different patterns of muscle weakness that we can see in patients who have different forms of muscular dystrophy. 
Additionally, what we have come to learn is that sometimes the, a patient, uh, a group of patients may have the same genetic mutations, but they may have different clinical symptoms. For example, some genetic mutations may cause congenital muscular dystrophies in some patients. In other patients, they may present in the adulthood or late teenage uh, um, times, and uh, the clinical um, findings may be quite different, and the rate of progression could be very different. There are some genetic mutations that can cause what we call distal myopathy, which means that the muscle weakness is predominantly affecting the distal portions of our muscles. What I mean by that is our hand muscles, our distal leg muscles, whereas in other patients, in the genetic mutation may cause a much more typical limb girdle muscular dystrophy phenotype, meaning that the shoulder and hip girdle muscles are much more severely affected. Furthermore, what we have come to understand is that the same genetic mutation may have different disease severity in different patients. For example, you can see here that POMT1 and 2 can cause a mild um, girdle muscular dystrophy in some patients, while in other patients it may cause a congenital muscular dystrophy. In other patients, it may cause a much more severe phenotype affecting the muscle, the eye, and the brain. So this is a paper that was taken from um, Dr. Lulak and Maloney's group up in the Mayo Clinic, where they illustrate that the same genetic mutation can sometimes have very different severity and phenotypes. In addition, what we've come to learn is that muscular, the genetic causes of muscular dystrophy not only affects the muscles, and we have come to learn that it can affect many other organ systems. Um, it can affect cognition, it can cause fatigue, it can affect the eyes by causing cataracts, it can cause cardiac abnormalities, gastrointestinal symptoms, pulmonary abnormalities, endocrine system. In some cases, it may even affect the nerves. So this, as I went through all these different systemic manifestations of these genetic mutations, it's truly humbling because there's so much that we did not know about these genetic mutations that we've come to learn. And this has caused us to really reevaluate our need to approach our, and care for our patients in a much more um, holistic and comprehensive method. So what should you be looking for when you think about clinical care in the center um, for yourself or for your family members who have a hereditary form of a neuromuscular disease? Certainly the clinical care excellence is one component, but you should also be looking for uh, participation in research because you want to make sure that you're getting the newest information that's available uh, for the particular disease that you're, that's being cared for. And you want to make sure that you have the opportunity to participate in uh, state-of-the-art research that's being conducted nationally. And I think that one aspect that we often forget is education. I not only um, are our patients and their caregivers educating us uh, as physicians and scientists, I hope that our caregivers and as well as our patients will also educate the, the next generation of physicians coming along. And that's one of the reasons why I often encourage our patients uh, to participate in seminars uh, that we give to medical students so that they understand um, some of the challenges of having the various neuromuscular disorders that they have. And that I think we want to have the best and the brightest minds in the future participate in clinical care and research for um, not only muscular dystrophy, but motor neuron disease patients and patients with all different forms of hereditary neuromuscular disorders. So what are the most essential elements that I would consider are uh, are components of the best practices of clinical care. The first is clinical expertise. When you look for care, you want to have it in the place where people, the, the, your medical team knows about the disease that you have or that, you, that your family has. And I think that is a critical component. The second is that it should be patient-centered. And I, I stole this uh, image from uh, the internet where it shows Copernicus' um, diagram of the sun being the middle. And in this situation, our patients and the family should be in the center and the care should, be, the, the care should uh, evolve and surround our patients. 
The third is that it should be multidisciplinary because it truly takes a village to take to care for our patients who have a hereditary neuromuscular disorder. And finally, it should be a collaborative team. For a long time, I think that in medicine, it could be a very disjointed experience for our patients and their caregivers, uh, because all the subspecialists seem to be very focused on their area. But what we really need to do is we need to communicate with each other and with our patients and caregiver in a much more effective way. And we certainly do not want to be like these folks who are uh, who have their blindfolds on and mistaken different parts of the elephant for different objects that they, they are touching. So I believe that this is a diagram that should illustrate the perfect setup for care of a hereditary neuro, uh, neuromuscular disorder. And I adapted this from um, a manuscript that was published by Dr. Bushby um, of the UK in 2010, where they, de where they um, produced a manuscript that described the best practices to care for patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. However, I believe that the concept that they described in this paper can be applied to many hereditary neuromuscular disorders. And I will go into each of these components in more detail. The first is I would like to discuss what are the important features of the diagnostic aspect of your care. When the patient develops neuromuscular symptoms and present themselves to a neuromuscular physician, and we are always concerned that um, is this a hereditary condition or an acquired condition? And this is a diagnostic algorithm that's illustrated here for a uh, a child who may be suspected of having Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But I believe the similar concept can be applied to any of the hereditary neuromuscular disorders and even acquired neuromuscular disorders. We need to think about the family history. We need to think about the laboratory components um, uh, that are abnormal, that make us suspect of neuromuscular disorders. Then we need to do the appropriate diagnostic testing in order to get to a specific diagnosis. And this, the expertise in neuromuscular disorders is critical during this process. When you're thinking about what physician or what team should I see to get my care, you want to make sure that, in fact, your physician is a neuromuscular specialist who has extensive experience in care of neuromuscular patients of various types. For example, in the you know, Philadelphia area, there are many excellent institutions with many highly skilled physicians who have this expertise. And you also want to make sure that the um, institution where you care has the uh, adequate support to provide the um, qual high quality laboratory studies, EMG and nerve conduction studies, perform muscle imaging such as MRI, and perform muscle biopsy so that we can get to the bottom of the diagnosis. I think that Brianna is an excellent example of the need for uh, genetic counseling as part of that care team, the neuromuscular care team, because genetic testing for hereditary neuromuscular disorders is becoming increasingly important as part of our care for patients who have neuromuscular diseases. And you certainly want to have a clinic coordinator who um, is passionate about neuromuscular diseases and the families and the patients, and you want to make sure that you have a very close relationship, working in relationship with your clinic coordinator. When a patient comes to see me for um, follow-up after di their diagnosis has been made, we'll often do our strength testing to assess for serial, um, serially to monitor disease progression, loss of function, and nowadays response to therapy. I often focus on range of motion because it is important to identify contractures early and to correct them if possible to prevent further complications. We sometimes perform time testing to evaluate the functions, and other times we use questionnaire to evaluate how a person is doing from a functional status and, and for, for the activities, activities of daily living. And finally, we sometimes administer motor function scales to monitor disease progression. Now, your neuromuscular team continues to follow you as you receive the diagnosis and start your therapies, uh, which I think is amazing uh, in 2020 that we can talk about genetic therapies. Because the importance of these diagnostic studies is to evaluate for adverse side effect, 
um, and also to make sure that um, the medication is doing what we think it should be doing. It is also very important that your team has adequate administrative support, because as we all know, that it is very challenging to negotiate um, sometimes an insurance company and all the paperwork that needs to be completed during the entire process. And once again, uh, your open communication with the clinic coordinators is vital. I think that this is particularly important as the patient transitions from uh, sometimes a pediatric clinic to adult clinic. You just want to make sure that the person who is helping you make the transition knows about um, what your needs are and be able to provide your new team with all the information from your previous teams. The second component I want to talk about is rehabilitation. So who are the main players in management of your rehabilitation needs? The first would be a physician who has an expertise in physical medicine and rehabilitation. And they often work with physical therapists and occupational therapists to assess a patient's function, posture, strength, gait, range of motion, and truncal alignment. When we think about rehabilitation interventions, we always begin with exercise, exercise, and exercise. For many of our patients, we focus on stretch, stretching exercises, strengthening, and positions because we want to prevent contractures, we want, uh, which can exacerbate uh, disability. And we think about uh, adequate splinting and orthosis when necessary. Our rehabilitation team can also help us with other aspects of our care, such as mobility devices, such as um, uh, proper uh, sized um, uh, canes, um, walkers, and motorized equipment such as power wheelchairs. And I think that this is a good illustration of all the different exercises that's important for a care of a neuromuscular patient throughout the course of their uh, disease. In addition, uh, the rehabilitation team can also help us with assist assistive technology. I think that many of you may have heard about uh, you know, Elon Musk with his uh, neural um, interventions uh, that he would like to develop for um, patients who have neurological disorders. And I think that is truly the cutting edge of technology. Until that becomes more widely available, we have, have, we have many tools currently that are, allow our patients to be much more independent and allow our patients to be able to interact much more effectively um, um, in their day-to-day -day lives. And these are just an example of some of the tools that are currently available uh, to patients to overcome their disability. The third component of our multidisciplinary care team is our orthopedic team. So our orthopedic um, and sports medicine colleagues help us assess range of motion for our patients, and they will also assess the spine for scoliosis, and they perform mm -hmm. radiological studies uh, to evaluate um, the spine curvature, which is very important uh, to evaluate for scoliosis, which may impact um, functional independence as well as respiratory functions. We don't often think about an, an endocrinologist being involved in the care of a patient, but they are quite important because of their role in evaluation, evaluating bone dysentometry and also for management of bone health. I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes talking about bone health because this is an area that's often neglected in the multidisciplinary care. Because our patients with neuromuscular disorders have decreased mobility and muscle weakness, and some of our patients are receiving glucocorticoid therapy, they are at increased risk for osteoporosis, osteopenia, and uh, bone disorders. So it is recommended that the, the, our patients have uh, adequate supplementation of calcium vitamin D, and also that they have adequate evaluation of the bone health by having DEXA scans on a regular basis, as well as spine radiograph uh, to evaluate for uh, potential abnormalities so that interventions can be initiated as early as possible. Sometimes the, some patients may require treatment with medications such as bisphosphonate um, to help supplement uh, bone growth. Next, I'd like to talk about the importance of psychosocial care for our patients. I think it's quite important and essential for there to be a mental health specialist as part of the care team. 
many of our patients will be referred to uh, neuropsychologists for neurocognitive evaluation and for speech and language function. And the social work is also an essential part of the team because it truly does take a village to care for a patient and particularly, I think, for psychosocial challenges that our patients and their families face. Some of the psychosocial management uh, may be, um, uh, include psychotherapy, and this can include patient and caregiver support groups and cognitive behavioral therapies. Sometimes we may refer our patients to psychiatry uh, for pharmacological therapy, such as SSRI. I think it is also critically important for our patients to have adequate neuropsychological assessment so that, that we can provide feedback and proper intervention when needed. And certainly the care coordinator plays a role in providing support for our patients and their caregivers and their families. And home health service is an essential part where they can be on-site visit uh, for our patients and their families uh, to assess their needs at home. I know that during the time of COVID, this may be particularly challenging, and we need to utilize our uh, virtual platform so that we can see patients and their caregivers uh, where they are and to provide the psychosocial support that you all need. Next, I would like to address cardiac care. Cardiac management is becoming increasingly important as we recognize uh, the very severity of cardiac dysfunction in patients who have various forms of hereditary neuromuscular disorders. And the cardiologist plays a central role in the evaluation of our patients. All patients should have a routine EKG um, to evaluate for baseline abnormalities and also help us uh, in the future as we monitor um, new symptoms that a patient may experience. An echocardiogram is also important for evaluating the, the cardiac function. The whole term monitoring is critical if a patient develops symptoms such as syncope um, or dizziness, shortness of breath, or new other, other new cardiac symptoms. And finally, I think that uh, this is a good imaging of the newest technologies that are available uh, using the MRI to image the heart so we can better understand the heart function and structure. What are some of the cardiac interventions uh, that may be available in patients who do have uh, cardiac dysfunction? Many medications are often started early um, to prevent additional cardiac complications in the future, and this includes the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or um, ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Um, many patients require the use of beta blockers to, um, to prevent uh, or treat arrhythmias. We also have um, diuretics uh, to prevent congestive, um, symptoms of congestive heart failures. For patients who have more severe cardiac abnormalities, they may require left ventricular assist devices. Um, and these uh, devices are becoming much more sophisticated. Cardiac pacemakers and internal defibrillators are also important uh, for individuals who may have an underlying cardiac dysrhythmia to prevent um, uh, a uh, comp potential complication of these dysrhythmias. Next, I would like to talk about um, our colleagues in the pulmonary and sleep medicine who are an essential part of our care team. Pulmonologists often are involved with our patients quite early because one of the concerns that we often have is that our patients ventilating adequately. So what do I mean by ventilating? I think that one of the most common concerns that our patients have is that they're not getting adequate oxygen, that they're short of breath uh, because oxygen is not being delivered to their blood. Actually, that is not something that we often worry about. In fact, one of the earliest symptoms that we are quite concerned about is our patient's ability to get rid of carbon dioxide from their blood. And that Usually, most patients who have a um, respiratory problems due to a neuromuscular condition, they do not have any problems oxygenating their blood. It is the ability to get rid of carbon dioxide that seems to be much more impaired, especially early on um, and throughout the course of the disease. Our pulmonologist colleagues will perform studies like spirometry to evaluate how well the respiratory muscles are able to. Um, to help our expand our lungs and also push our air out when needed. 
Sometimes pulse oximetry will be necessary to measure, measure the oxygen content in the blood. Um, we also measure the carbon dioxide level, which is capno capnography. And in some rare circumstances, we do get arterial blood gases to measure the oxygen and carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide concentration in the blood. I frequently refer my patient to sleep specialist uh, uh, to consider the need for a sleep study, especially if they seem tired, fatigued when they wake up in the morning, which could be a sign of um, sleep apnea. Another essential member of a team is a respiratory therapist who are involved with evaluating the respiratory symptoms uh, for a patient, performing spirometry and pulse oximetry, and also providing feedback regarding the use of various uh, pulmonary equipment, which I'll discuss in the next couple of slides. This is um, a, a chart that was adopted from uh, Dr. Bushby's um, publication, where they talked about the various interventions that this recommended for individuals who have been diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I think this is quite applicable to all patients who have neuromuscular disorders. A routine sitting fourth vital capacity is, um, I think, um, necessary for all individuals uh, who have a neuromuscular disorder to evaluate the baseline um, ability to um, mobilize air in their lungs. And also, this test um, helps us assess when the patient may require uh, respiratory interventions such as a uh, non-invasive ventilator. Now, you, as you can see here, the, the diagram shows that, uh, um, that a spirometry to measure force vital capacity should be performed at least annually. And I know that in many ALS clinics, we perform this study almost once every three months. For other patients, they may require a measurement of, post, um, of the oxygen content in the blood by pulse oximetry. Um, we may evaluate peak cough flow because we want to determine whether or not a patient has an effective cough. And we may measure other parameters such as maximum inspiratory and expiratory pressure because this um, measure, these measurements which measure the force that you're able to Take a, uh, take a deep breath and the force that you're able to generate when you breathe out uh, very forcefully can be the earliest abnormality in patients who have neuromuscular weakness. In other patients, we do measure end tidal carbon dioxide level by capnography as illustrated here. Now, what do we do with all these measurements and all these tests? If it turns out that a person has uh, signs of hyperventilation, um, meaning that um, their vital capacity may be decreased or their carbon dioxide level may be elevated in their blood, we may send them for additional testing, including arterial blood gas, or sometimes we may do other studies, including sleep studies, to determine whether or not a non-invasive ventilator may be helpful. Um, other signs of hypoventilation, as I talked about, include early morning fatigue or headaches um, in some patients, and they may, this may be signs that um, additional studies may be needed and the intervention should be initiated. So what are some of the pulmonary sleep interventions that we uh, currently have available? We often recommend our patients to perform respiratory exercises, including breast stacking, um, to expand uh, the lung capacity. We also use devices such as a BiPAP or, um, or ABAPS, um, uh, non-invasive ventilators, uh, usually in the evening, because all our abdominal contents push up against our diaphragm, which may be weakened by a neuromuscular disorder. And by using the non-invasive ventilator at night while a person lays down, it gives a, us a little extra pressure to help our diaphragm to expand our lungs. Some patients may require more invasive ventilation, um, and this can be uh, necessary in order to have adequate oxygenation and ventilation. And we often recommend, as illustrated in this diagram, a mechanical insufflator and exufflator, which is also known as a cough assist. The cough assist is a very useful device to augment a weak cough, um, particularly as the winter season or season allergies kicks in, because some people have difficulties uh, expir um, expirating, um, getting rid of their phlegm from the deep airways. So the cough assist can augment this process and help our patients get rid of that uh, phlegm that may be very deep in our airways. Next, I'd like to talk about the role of the gastroenterologist. 
We often don't think about uh, a gastroenterologist having a role in treatment of our, uh, our muscular or neuromuscular patients. But they're actually quite important because gastrointestinal symptoms are very, very common, not only among people who have neuromuscular disorders, but just in the general community. So what exactly does a gastroenterologist do? Well, they can provide a routine uh, evaluation for various gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, such as um, um, uh, nausea, vomiting, or sometimes um, the feeling of um, uncomfortable fullness uh, and constipation, and they can perform studies including upper and lower endoscopy uh, to make sure that there is no blockage or other structural abnormalities in our gastrointestinal symptoms. Gastroenterologists are also very good at performing studies that look at how well our food and liquids are able to move through our stomach and our intestines, and that's known as the GI motility studies. This is an important study because Patients who have neuromuscular disorders, um, the smooth muscle um, and the nerves that innervate the muscles in our gastrointestinal system can be affected in people with neuromuscular disorders. And this is where the gastrointestinal motility studies plays an important role. Some patients may have gastroparesis, and that's why they have this uncomfortable sense of feeling fullness. Some people have autonomic dysfunction, meaning that a nerve that controls our our GI systems are dysfunctional, and they can develop symptoms uh, such as constipation and sometimes um, loose bowel movements. Uh, they may develop reflux uh, because of these abnormalities, and therefore a motility studies will be helpful to understand whether or not this is happening in their gut. Other radiological studies um, are also important, for example, esophagrams, um, or sometimes just a CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis to make sure that there's no other structural abnormalities. Our gastroenterology uh, colleagues can often help us prescribe a constipation management regimen. And you know, we know that this is, uh, can be very uncomfortable for our patients who have decreased mobility and sometimes uh, decreased um, fluid intake or uh, food intake in general, and this can lead to uncomf uncomfortable constipation. Constipation may also be a symptom of dysautonomia, once again, a abnormality of the autonomic nervous system. The gastroenterologist may also prescribe medication for dysmotility symptoms and for reflux, and they play an important role in helping with managing these symptoms. Next, I'd like to talk about the role of a speech and language pathologist and nutritionist. It is critical for patients who have speech and swallowing difficulty to have an evaluation with a, with a speech pathologist. And the reason for this is that we want to make sure that a person does not ask, have silent aspiration, meaning that the food particles or liquid are entering their airways rather than going down their esophagus as they normally should do. A speech and language pathologist can perform a bedside evaluation both for swallowing and for speech uh, difficulties. And they can perform modified bearing swallow study, which is using the x-ray to visualize how effective food particles and liquids are to enter um, our esophagus um, from our mouth uh, through our oropharynx into the stomach. They can also perform what's called fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, also known as FEES. Basically, what they do is that a, as a person swallows food or liquid, they take a small camera to look at the upper, um, uh, the upper um, swallowing uh, passage to make sure that the food particles and liquid are in fact entering the esophagus rather into the airways. In our clinic, the speech and language pathologists often work in a team uh, in conjunction with our nutritionist or dietitian, because if a person has difficulty um, with swallowing, then their diet may need to be modified to make sure that a person receives adequate nutrition, um, adequate hydration, um, uh, and this is an important partnership between the speech pathologist and, and, uh, and our dietitian. Furthermore, the, the, our dietitian nutritionist can also come up with a recommended meal plan so that 
a person receives adequate caloric intake and to make sure that all the different food groups are incorporated in their diet. We also want to make sure that our patients do not become vitamin deficient or they're missing a component, uh, important component of nutrition. Some of the ways for us to assess this include uh, food diaries or meal diaries and calorie counts at home. So when you talk to, when you meet your multidisciplinary team, uh, this is a very important member to make sure that you never miss because you know, I, I think that having a proper diet is an, a critical part of a care of a neuromuscular patient. Some of the interventions that can be provided by our speech and language pathologists and nutritionists, including bedside safe throttling strategy recommendations, such as sitting upright during all meals, uh, taking small sips and bites, alternating between liquids and solids, and sometimes you may need to double swallow to make sure that all the food particles does in fact enter your esophagus rather than stay in your upper uh, food passages. Our dietitian may recommend additional nutritional supplements if we find that there's inadequate caloric intake. Uh, sometimes we recommend you know, having an extra milkshake or adding a, a smoothie to your diet. Sometimes we would you know, recognize dehydration and recommend increasing the amount of fluid that a person takes daily. Sometimes vitamin supplements are, imp are important. Um, I was quite surprised how often that a person may be vitamin deficient. So we do check vitamin level as uh, part of the routine laboratory testing to make sure there's not another cause for a person's symptoms, uh, neuromuscular symptoms, which can be caused by vitamin deficiencies. So as I mentioned, the, the triad of clinical care, research, and education are some of the components that you should be looking for as you receive your care in a particular neuromuscular center. And we talked about clinical care, but now I will just briefly focus on research. This has already been very thoroughly covered by Dr. Patterson, and I will not go into in-depth detail about uh, research studies, but I do want to uh, highlight the importance of involvement in research for all neuromuscular clinic and neuromuscular physicians as well as patients. I have to say that um, it is because of the generosity and, um, and enthusiasm of our patients and their caregivers that we have made so many um, gains in our understanding and treatment of, neuro of hereditary neuromuscular disorders. And we're also very grateful for our partners, such as the Muscular Dystrophy Association, uh, in working with um, our uh, with the families um, to raise funds to continue to fund research and um, clinical trials, so that we can uh, bring new medications uh, and that's more effective for our patients who have hereditary neuromuscular disorders. And this slide just illustrates how. Um, what once seemed impossible are now currently available to um, patients who have a genetic neuromuscular disorders. I, I think that the, we always think about nusinersen, which is one of the, which is, um, one of the first um, genetic therapies for spinal muscular atrophy. And um, Dr. Patterson also talked about Zogensma, which is a, um, a treatment that utilizes a viral um, carrier to deliver the, the gene, uh, which will then be translated into a protein for patients who have spinal muscular atrophy. And many of you, I'm sure, have heard of etalercin uh, as well as adalerin for treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this is really a revolution in our, how we treat hereditary neuromuscular disorders. But I have to say that um, research studies is not without um, risks. And earlier this year, I attended a meeting where the physician introduced a child who has a, a rare genetic um, disorder called myotubular myopathy. And it was really an amazing experience for me as a physician to see this child uh, walk up to the stage um, after having received a gene therapy for um, the particular mutation that um, she had. And this was particularly um, um, uh, amazing 
just an uh, experience for me because I recalled seeing a child with the same mutation um, almost 20 years ago as a trainee. And the child um, really, and it was devastating for um, the child as well for their parents um, when they discovered that their child had this mutation. And I remember seeing that child later on um, very weak and requiring an invasive ventilator. So as you can imagine, um, you know, my joy in seeing this child who received this new gene therapy for the same mutation as my patients from 20 years ago. Unfortunately, this treatment turned out to have some um, severe side effects and resulted in two deaths in two of the patients, and which is um, which really makes us uh, even more humble in that we really need to do better in, in evaluating these treatments um, and understand the potential risks that our patients are, and their families are taking when they receive these um, novel um, you know, therapies um, that we believe is groundbreaking. Um, that our patients are taking on these extraordinary risks when they receive these therapies. Um, but I have to say that um, you know, the, our muscular dystrophy patients, um, our motor neuron disease patients, and their caregivers are a tenacious and strong group of uh, individuals, and that um, they will continue to push forward in spite of the many setbacks that we have with gene therapy. So this is a uh, diagram of the complexity of bringing a particular treatment from discovery all the way to FDA approval. And the reason I wanted to put this diagram up um, is because I wanted to just illustrate that when you select um, the institution where you receive your care, sometimes your physicians may be involved in um, preclinical or the discovery phase of the research, and sometimes your clinicians may be um, involved in phase one, two, or three uh, of the research process. So I think that they're all equally important in bringing new therapies and helping us understand um, uh, different forms of hereditary and non-hereditary neuromuscular disorders, and that these are all the things that you should be looking for as you participate in your clinical care and work with your research physicians. And finally, I think in the last couple of slides, I just want to um, put up a, a, um, some of the um, probably somewhat outdated uh, information about some of these studies that's currently rolling uh, in treating patients with neuro, um, autoimmune and uh, hereditary neuromuscular disorders. And I think that what's very uh, exciting for us is the new mechanisms that's being evaluated and intervened upon for these therapies. Um, we're not just looking at anti-inflammatory therapy or anti-fibrotic therapies, but we're really looking at cell-based therapies and gene replacement. And that's part of the excitement of being uh, involved in neuromuscular research. And I think I will end there, um, and I will be happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you very much. Um, can you tell our um, attendees that are on the line, where can they access seminars for the medical students that you spoke of earlier in your talk? So I think the best way to um, participate in those seminars is um, by working with your neuromuscular teams that are based in the university. So many times um, I call upon our gra gracious patients and their care providers uh, to participate in these lectures and seminars. Although I think that it may be a little bit more challenging nowadays, um, given the COVID pandemic, but I think I'm hoping that uh, these seminars will be adopting a virtual platform for that to happen. Okay. And you had talked about proteins in the beginning. Um, does a protein diet have any effect on any of this? I think that, well, I, I have to say that what we take in via our diet in terms of amino acids and protein does not affect the structure of the protein components on your muscle that causes a muscular dystrophy. In other words, what we eat through our diets 
cannot affect how effectively our cells are, if, are able to produce those proteins that are needed, um, then, or that may be dysfunctional in muscular dystrophy. Um, okay. Because the reason for that is that those proteins are abnormal because the, the DNA that encodes those proteins are mutated. So that it's not something that we can alter through our diet. Okay. And then for um, dysferlin, which one of the treatments is most promising in your opinion? Um, <laughs> um, I think that um, there's a strong interest in genetic modification, meaning that gene-based therapy. Um, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Patterson that we want to intervene before a person has significant injury to their muscle. But we also know that many of our patients are currently living with uh, muscular dystrophy, and they should also they also need to be treated. And I am optimistic that there will be therapies that will be effective for both symptomatic a and asymptomatic individuals. Okay, and. Someone is wondering about calcium. Can you take too much calcium? I often recommend about um, 1,500 milligrams of calcium per day for individuals who have um, bone uh, thinning bones, um, which is also known as osteopenia or osteoporosis. And this often has to be accompanied by vitamin D. But the one caveat about calcium intake is that some individuals are predisposed to developing uh, kidney stones and of varying type. So you have to be uh, somewhat uh, cautious about uh, the amount of calcium you take in. And I think that this should really be um, under the, uh, this should be guided by a physician who understands the individual's um, underlying medical conditions. Um, because sometimes over, in, over um, um, ingestion or taking too much of a vitamin supplement can adversely affect a person's health. Do you have a recommended dose for vitamin D? I, I usually recommend what is um, in the multivitamin or that's included okay. in the calcium supplements. And what I often tell my patients is that if possible, the best, so the best source of calcium and vitamin D is from what we eat. I think it doesn't get better than that. So yogurt, um, fat-free yogurts, um, um, milk, ice cream, um, I think um, are some of the best sources of the calcium. Uh, and I know that uh, we need to be very careful about sun exposure because of um, you know, a skin cancer. Um, and certainly that's something to be aware of. And that's why calcium supplementation is important rather than just exposing the skin to the sun. Okay. And last question that I see that I come in. Um, where can someone find out about Desmond research and the progress of that? So I always uh, refer um, individuals to the MDA um, website, um, also to clinicaltrial.gov. Clinical yeah. <laughs> I know that sometimes these websites can be overwhelming, um, but uh, I still feel that those are the most effective resources to learn about clinical studies. I think that when you um, interact with your neuromuscular physicians, you can also find out who are the national experts in those particular um, genetic mutations or set of proteins, um, and they may be able to refer you to the particular center that may be doing specialized studies in a particular genetic mutation. Okay, all right. Well, I don't see anything else that has come through. Thank you very much. I love the presentation. I thought it was very thorough. And uh, I love how you went through all of the multifacets of the multidisciplinary team. I think that that was really great. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.